to the Johnson Space Center for the STS-29 pre-flight crew press conference. Uh, Discovery's crew commander uh, is Michael Coates. He's going to introduce the rest of his crew. I'll each talk a little bit about their uh, crew responsibilities on the flight, and then we'll press into uh, questions and answers. Mike? Well, thank you, Jeff. I'd like to welcome all of you to our L-30 press conference. Uh, we're quite proud to be flying the, the third flight uh, since the accident, second flight of Discovery since the accident. I'd like to introduce my crew, my pilot, John Blaha, my mission specialist, Bob Springer, Jim Buckley, and Jim Bajan. We'll go right down the line. John's going to talk a little bit about the flight and uh, the experiment I've made him the prime on, the IMAX camera uh, payload. John? Okay. Uh, we're going to, if we launch on schedule, it'll be the 23rd of February at 8.30 in the morning uh, Eastern Standard Time. It'll be a five-day mission. Uh, we plan to land at Edwards on the uh, 28th of February. Uh, we will be carrying a 55% ohms load, three cryo tanks. We'll go direct insertion into uh, 160 nautical mile orbit. Uh, once we get on orbit, we'll configure the vehicle. Uh, one of the things I'll be responsible for, although all of us will be working, is the IMAX camera. And we've been working with our good friends up in Toronto, Canada, who sponsor that. Uh, as you know, they have many films mm -hmm. out. One of their films related to space is The Dream is Alive. Uh, they plan to build a new film, and its uh, theme will be the fragile Earth. So that's basically what the IMAX experiment is about. Uh, Bob Springer will now tell you some more about uh, the TDRS IUS deploy. Bob? Thanks, John. The, uh, the primary purpose of this mission as far as the primary payload is the IUS TDRS combination. In this case, we're going to take the TDRS, the tracking data relay satellite, and uh, put up uh, which will be the, the third in a series of the, uh, this series of satellites, a multi-channel communication satellite that will actually op operate in geosynchronous orbit. Uh, with this the launch of this satellite, uh, we'll have actually a, a three satellite constellation, which will give us uh, essentially 100 percent communication coverage. Uh, for our operations as well as for other users and to provide an on-orbit spare. Uh, the TDRS satellite, of course, is the satellite portion of it. The inertial upper stage is the booster that will take the satellite from our deploy orbit of 160 nautical miles up to the 22,000 nautical mile uh, operating orbit for the satellite. One of the other experiments that we're working on this, uh, on this flight is the protein crystal growth experiment, uh, an experiment that's already flown uh, several times, uh, most recently on STS-26. We're very fortunate, as a matter of fact, that uh, on this flight we're carrying several repeat things, including the, the IUS TDRS as well as the protein crystal growth. So we've, we're building on other people's experience, but uh, be, hope to be able to carry forth uh, that experience and, uh, and build on it some more. The protein crystal growth, of course, will take a look at uh, a variety of protein crystals uh, and expand on how the crystal growth uh, propagates in the microgravity of space and then bring those crystals uh, back down for analysis and, and further information uh, and hopefully lead to some breakthroughs in the area of, uh, of proteins and enzymes that can be useful to uh, all of us here on this planet. Jim Buckley will tell you a little bit about the space station heat pipe experiment and uh, the Earth observation that we're going to be doing. Thanks, Bob. I'll be uh, mission specialist too on this flight and in that capacity I'll be working with uh, Mike and John as a flight engineer doing asset and entry to help them with uh, orbiter systems during those phases of flight. On orbit, I'll be uh, helping to support uh, Bob and Jim with the IUS. And uh, as Bob mentioned, I'll be uh, at least prime responsible for SHARE, which is a uh, advanced heat pipe type radiator. It's an experiment that will be used to demonstrate uh, that kind of, kind of technology for space station. Uh, we'll also carry a package, which is pretty much passive, called OASIS, mm -hmm. uh, used to document to the environmental conditions uh, in the orbiter's payload bay. And we'll also have a very extensive uh, continuation of our Earth observation program. The theme of that is uh, pretty much uh, a parallel of what the IMAX is doing in that we're documenting much of our Earth's surfaces. It turns out our uh, orbits go over uh, many of the areas that we're now interested in, in South America and in Africa. Uh, in looking at just what's happening to our environment. Uh, we'll be making daylight passes over those particular areas, so we'll be doing a lot of, uh, a lot of photography to look at different elements. <laughs>
different uh, geology and different morphology in those areas. And let me let uh, Jim Bajan now tell you a little bit about what he's going to be doing. Well, I'll be flying as the, uh, the Mission Specialist 3 slot, MS-3. And my responsibilities overlap some of the ones you've already heard about. I'll be uh, backing Bob up on the IOS and worrying about Tedris and uh, backing Jim up on the SHARE experiment he already described. Uh, the ones I'll be primarily responsible for are uh, some of the student experiments, uh, along with John Blaha. One is a bone healing experiment, and the other one is a chicken embryo development experiment. And uh, they're from the student experiment uh, category, and I think you'll hear about more, of the, more about those later today. Uh, along the main mid-deck experiments, one is Chromex, which is a plan experiment which has been flown several times in the past. What this is uh, designed to look for is changes in plant development and growth in zero-G, with the thought of looking forward to space station to see, see if some of the closed environmental support systems which might provide water, uh, oxygen, scrub CO2 from the air, et cetera, food source even, can be grown in zero-G successfully. So this is one of the, uh, the foundation-type experiments which will let us better understand can plants grow correctly. Uh, one of the problems they've seen in the past is there's different chromosome abnormalities and root tip growth differences, and they want to document that on this flight. Along with that, we're flying... Uh, numerous DSOs, which are detailed supplementary objectives. Uh, these, uh, in, in this particular mission, deal with life sciences type questions. Uh, two deal with uh, drug, drug pharmacokinetic uh, studies, that is looking how drugs are metabolized in zero G. And we feel there's some difference in the way when you take a, a drug that you would take possibly for uh, the space adaptation syndrome or whatever, how it's metabolized, and it may affect you more or less so in orbit. So we're doing studies, and everybody's participating in those. We're also doing some looking at the adaptation that, that takes place in zero-G, that is, when you go in, in the weightlessness, uh, the fluid shifts in your body and it changes the way your body responds, and we're looking at central venous pressure changes, cerebral blood flow changes, uh, changes in the response of your autonomic nervous system through receptors in your neck, which might uh, contribute to some lightheadedness after flight, especially on longer duration missions, and this will give us some baseline data, which will let us better uh, anticipate what to expect in and insure ourselves against in the future for longer duration orbiter flights, as well as uh, space station flights uh, some years down the pike. And that basically covers my prime responsibilities. Thank you, Mike. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, we've got a number of uh, DTOs, that's detailed test objectives, to go along with uh, DSOs. Uh, one of the things we're trying to work out right now is a procedure right after we get off the tank, uh, the external tank, try to take some pictures of the tank. After we back away from it a little bit, uh, do a maneuver to, to take some pictures of the tank and, and document uh, what the tank looks like after we uh, get off of it. It's still being worked out. We hope we can uh, get some good pictures on this flight. We're going to do a water uh, cloud formation uh, DTO where they will have a, <clears throat> a mobile site here on the ground uh, and in several places around the world. And we hope to dump water and uh, look at it from the ground and see what the, uh, what the water dump looks like. On Jim's previous flight, 61A, uh, it looks like they may have gone around the earth once and run into the water they dumped uh, previously. So they want to document that a little bit better. So we're going to do some very controlled uh, water dumps at specific times uh, during the flight and see if they can document that a little bit better. Uh, another interesting DTO is is one we call the IMU Reference Recovery DTO. If we lose our navigation platform on the orbiter, we have a procedure to, to use the stars to get ourselves an attitude uh, back, attitude platform uh, for our navigation base. Uh, they've got some interesting proposals where we can use the sun and the moon and some of the planets uh, to get a very quick attitude uh, reference frame. Uh, we like that. It's always a lot easier to find the sun and some of the stars when we we're hoping that works out real well. The, uh, on landing, uh, we're looking at several different possibilities right now. We'd very much like to get a crosswind landing test in if the wind conditions are, are exactly right out at Edwards. We've been trying for 27 flights to get uh, a good crosswind landing test, and uh, we've only had one landing, which was a very good test, about 11 knots of crosswind. So if the, if the wind conditions are just right, on the day we land, we may try to get a crosswind landing test uh, in. If they're not, we're hoping we can go to the runway out at Edwards and get a good test of the brakes 
uh, on the orbiter. Of course, the 26 and 27 flew, and they landed on the lake bed, which gives them a lot of deceleration just from the lake bed itself. So they didn't get a real good uh, test of the, of the brake system. We didn't put a lot of brake energy into the brakes. So we're hoping we can go to the runway uh, perhaps this time and, and uh, get a real good braking test and, and see how they hold up. Uh, that's about it, Jeff. We'll start with questions here in Houston.